Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit and a heavy chain in his hand. He seized the dragon, that old serpent who is the devil, Satan, and bound him in chains for a thousand years. The angel threw him into the bottomless pit, which he then shut and locked so Satan could not deceive the nations anymore until the thousand years were finished. Afterward, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and the people sitting on them had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony about Jesus, for proclaiming the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his statue, nor accepted his mark on their forehead or their hands. They came to life again, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This is the first resurrection. The resurrection of the dead did not come back to life until the thousand years had ended. Blessed be, blessed are, blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. For them, the second death holds no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. <coughs> when the thousand years come to an end, Satan will be let out of his prison. He will go out to deceive the nations called Gog and Magog in every corner of the earth. He will gather them together for battle, a mighty army as numberless as sand along the seashore. And I saw them as they went up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded God's people and the beloved city. But fire came from heaven, but fire from heaven came down on the attacking armies and consumed them. Then the devil, who had deceived them, was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet. There they will be tormented day and night forever. Once again, good morning, church. I'm Pastor Jeff Collins. I'm glad to have you all with us this morning. This morning we're talking about the millennium. It's a, a complicated subject. I always thought it was pretty simple. I always read through it and um, just kind of blew by it and uh, took for granted what was in there. But um, I find the more I read about it, the more complex it gets. First of all, I want you to know I believe the millennium. I've always uh, I believed there's a thousand-year reign that will happen with Christ. Um, some of the details, uh, as I say, get uh, pretty confusing. And then we hear people preaching about this period of time and adding things in that aren't there in the scripture. And we say, wait, no, wait a minute, where'd they get that from? Um, there's a lot of theological input that happens. What that means is we take the scripture, which is the authoritative, inspired word of God, and we try to explain it by human reasoning, which is not uh, the authoritative word of God. It is the understanding of human beings. And thus, the church has been divided over the last two millennia as to what this millennium uh, really will be. Um, and uh, there's a, a lot of uh, confusion about this. But I think that um, while we may not have perfect clarity about this, we should have perfect charity about this, recognizing that uh, there are varying viewpoints among believing, Christians who love the Lord, um, and in the end, we're going to find out exactly how this all unravels. And it may not be that the Lord got us there by the way that our theological GPS wanted to take us, but uh, His way is right, and I know that in the end, uh, we will find that, uh, that it was all true. Uh, I appreciate what J. Scott Duval uh, commented when he was writing about the millennium. He says, ironically, our own God-given curiosity can sometimes work against us. When we absolutely cannot live without, with any tension or loose ends or unanswered questions about how the world will end, we are susceptible to authoritative, airtight answers and systems that foster an unbiblical kind of fear and compromise when it comes to truth. Beware of theological wild goose chases when Jesus' commands are clearly set before us. We do not know the future. 
but we do know Jesus who holds the future. With that in mind, I invite you to open your Bibles this morning to Revelation chapter 20. Uh, if you didn't bring your Bible with you, you can reach in front of you and find one of the pew Bibles. Uh, the ones you'll find in your pew right now are a new international version and there will be slightly different uh, translation. Uh, we're still working on getting the New Living Translations into the uh, pulpit, into the uh, uh, pews. And if you'd like to help, we'll put the labels on them and get them out here. Uh, during the week, call Mary, our secretary. She can use some help. Um, and, uh, you know, if uh, you didn't bring your Bible this morning, you know, you know look around. You can see who else didn't bring their Bible. I'll we'll be encouraged next week to bring your Bible. With that, let's uh, bow our heads and our hearts for a word of prayer. Heavenly Fathers, we come to your word. We come open to all that you would teach us. We pray that you would lead us into the truth. We know that your word is truth. Sometimes it's more than we can understand because you, as you have said, your ways are higher than our ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are your ways higher than our ways and your thoughts higher than our thoughts. Help us to grasp and understand that which we should. Give us the humility to admit that which we cannot understand. And give us the faith to trust in you through all of it. For you've promised to get us all safely home. We do pray that you'd send your Holy Spirit into this place and enliven our hearts by it as we hear your word. For we know that your word's not just print on a page, not just stories in a book, but it's living and it's active. You impress your presence upon us through the preaching of your word, and we invite your presence in this time. We pray for the one who teaches, that you guard the door of his lips, that your truth would come out. For we came to this place to see Jesus and him only, and it is in his precious name that we pray. Amen. If you're looking in Revelation chapter 20, you'll look... Uh, in verses 1 through 3, which I just want to read with you once again. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with a key to the bottomless pit and a heavy chain in his hand. He seized the dragon, that old serpent who was the devil, Satan, and bound him in chains for a thousand years. The angel threw him into the bottomless pit, which we have uh, referred to as the abyss before, the NIV calls it the abyss, which he then shut and locked. So Satan could not deceive the nations anymore until a thousand years were finished. Afterward, he must be released for a little while. Satan is bound and chained and thrown into the bottomless pit and imprisoned for a thousand years. It's interesting that God sends an angel to do this, to Satan. The great enemy of our souls is subdued by one angel. Why? Because he is not God's equal. It does not require God or Jesus Christ to come in person and bind Satan. Satan is a created being who is subject to God's authority. And when God sends his angel, the angel has no problem binding the great enemy of our souls and throwing him into prison. It's interesting that the names of Satan are defined here. So there's no mistake. Uh, of who we're referring to. And, uh, and his names also reflect much of, of the uh, devastation that he's brought into human history and that which is also being bound with him and sealed in the abyss with the bottomless pit. He is called the dragon. If we we're, have been here through the uh, Revelation series, you know in chapter 12 we ran into the heavenly picture of of the uh, eternal struggle that the, the great red dragon um, opposed God and rebelled against God and, and uh, a third of the angels rebelled with him against God and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and defeated him and the dragon was thrown to earth where uh, <coughs> he would uh, there wage war against the Messiah and against those who follow the Messiah and so we find the, the dragon here taken up, that he will no longer have any influence, that his rebellion against God will have, have no power. <coughs> He's also referred to as a serpent. <clears throat> First time we encountered Satan, it is as a serpent at the fall of human beings. When they are put in the Garden of Eden and they have everything, and then they're told only that they are not to eat from the, the tree of the knowledge of, of 
from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And uh, the serpent, Satan, comes to the woman and says, did God really say that to you? Did he say, you'll die if you eat that fruit? How, you will die? You'll just be made like God. Satan's deceit from the very beginning has to make, to cause people not to trust the truth of God's word. It calls God a liar. Satan, uh, that serpent, uh, being bound and his lies being bound with him. He's also called the devil. The devil is the one who tempted Jesus in the wilderness, the one who tempts us, the one who's referred to as a murderer, the, a liar and the father of lies. And the, the ruler of this world has been bound and made powerless for a thousand years. Satan, the accuser, we find that most clearly in the book of Job where uh, Satan goes before the Lord and, 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 and tries to uh, make Job look bad. Though he's a righteous man, oh, well, he's only righteous because you're so good to him, God. And he accuses us before God. There will be no longer be anyone to accuse us before God when Satan is thrown into the abyss for a thousand years. Now, it's interesting here. Uh, this is for a thousand years that Satan has been. A thousand years of what is come to coming and, and, and the reign of the saints with Christ. Um, this, this thousand is, is uh, six times in these scriptures, from verse 2 to verse 7. If you're looking at your scriptures and you underline the word a thousand, you'll find that once in each verse uh, it is referred to. Uh, that's, a, that's a lot of times. There's a lot of emphasis happening here on that. Uh, <clears throat> the word thousand in the uh, Latin is millennium, um, as we know, which refers to a thousand years. And so there are theological uh, views on the millennium. When we talk about the millennium, we're talking about this thousand years when Satan is bound and uh, a thousand year rule of Christ on the present earth. This is the only reference to the millennium that is found in the Bible. The only one. These seven verses. Um, and part of the, the challenge theologically here is to figure out how that coincides with the rest of the scripture. How it all fits together. How it's all going to unravel. Um, because this is a, a limited teaching in a limited place, it, it, it has been a, a challenge theologically, and it's caused uh, many divisions in the church you know, over the last two millennia um, that uh, people hold to, to various views. But the problem is that we get the thought that if we're looking at the end times, we've got to know everything about them if we're going to get through them. Right? That our knowledge is going to be what sustains us through the end times, through the cataclysms, through the ju judgments, through the, the upheaval that the Bible predicts in the end times. And that is not true. Even if we know nothing of what is coming, it is not our knowledge that will save us. There is only one who will save us. There is only one way that we will get through the end times. Jesus, when he was uh, facing crucifixion, when he was preparing his disciples, he said, you know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas says to him, Lord, you don't even know where are you going. How can we know the way? You remember Jesus' response. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. If we want to know the way that we're going to get safely home to heaven, it isn't by all the things that we know and having the right theological constructs. It is going to be because of Jesus Christ who is the way. And the closer that we can follow to him, the better off we'll be. <laughs> when we were at uh, Israel's wedding, uh, uh, we went to the uh, rehearsal dinner, and then we were going somewhere else in Wilmington to go to uh, um, to the to the dinner after the after the rehearsal. And I had no clue where we were going. So uh, nowadays, what they do is they text you the the address, and you put it in your own GPS, and it gets you there. Uh, what we used to do when you didn't know where you were going, you know, you tried to describe it as many times as you could. You'd take a left here, you'd take a right there, and, and you see the person <laughs> glazing over because they have no clue, and you finally say, follow me. Just follow me. Now, if you've ever had to follow somebody when you don't have the address, and
and you don't have a cell phone, so you can't call them, and you, you, you don't know where you're going, guess how you follow them? You stay close. You stay so close, you don't want anybody getting between you and cutting you off from them where you can't see them and tell whether they took a right or a left. You're going to stay right on your tail. You're going to stay right close to them. You don't want to let them out of your sight. You don't want to let them get up in the distance. You, you might lose sight of them. And then where are you? Jesus says, follow me. And as we go through the, the, the twists and turns of the end time, it is following Him that is going to be our key. Because, yeah, we have a GPS. But if you've ever used a GPS, you know, sometimes it takes you on some wild goose chases. And you don't know where that's going. What we want to count on is the one we're following. We've been called to follow Him. Now, as with that in mind, let's get into the millennial views. There are basically four millennial views. Views of the thousand years, the end times. Um, these are the historic millennial views. There are overlaps sometimes between them. There's some confusion between them. I'm going to give you the most simple and straightforward uh, way of looking at these millennial views. Uh, first of all, there's uh, premillennialism, pre meaning before. Uh, and all of these millennial views really have to do with when will Christ physically return to the earth. And so premillennialism believes that Christ will physically return to the earth and set up an earthly physical kingdom before the millennium, pre-millennium. And there are two, uh, two major premillennialist views, dispensational uh, premillennialist view and a historical premillennialist view. So those are believing that, we are, that Jesus is coming first. And then the millennium will be set up a thousand years already. Um, <clears throat> Second, uh, the third one would be post-millennial. Now, post has nothing to do with breakfast cereal. Uh, post meaning after. So, the belief that Jesus would come after the millennium. Um, don't get quite to that slide yet. I'll get there in just a second. Um, and then there's amillennialism. A uh, in the Latin means against or, or away from. Um, and uh, the amillennialists... Uh, believe that the thousand years is a symbolic figurative language like much of Revelation is and, uh, and that it's the church age that it's talking about. We're going to look at those in a little more detail. But, but just, just that overview. Premillennial, postmillennial, um, amillennial. Those are, those are three kinds and then there's two kinds of premillennial. Um, I put them all together for, for a second just to simply say, they're all Christians. All the people who have all these views are, are Bible-believing, love Jesus, going to heaven, Christians who are trying to make sense of the scriptures as best they can. They're not enemy camps. Uh, they're not heresies in any way. Uh, at some point in Christian history, any one of these have been a prominent Christian view in the church. At any one time in history, you can find famous uh, theologians and preachers who have uh, uh, promoted these particular views, respected names, names that, uh, that, that you would trust, but they have differing views. And it's okay. They're all believers. Okay? Um, I think that there are some views that are a little bit more biblical and have a little more grounding than others. Uh, and some of those history has sort of borne out. Um, but again, they're all, they're all Christians um, just trying to make sense of where this millennium fits in, in all of this. So I want to start with post-millennialism. Post-millennialism is probably early, uh, an early view of the church. Um, Post-millennialists post believed that Jesus was coming after the thousand-year reign. And the repercussions of that are significant, because if you believe that Jesus is going to come after the thousand-year reign, then, uh, then you see church history itself, from the time of the resurrection to the time of his second coming, as part of that millennium. Uh, they saw the, uh, the thousand years as uh, perhaps being symbolic, um, but it was the church age itself. And they believed that uh, 
Um, as the gospel was preached, that righteousness would spread throughout the earth, and that uh, God's kingdom would pervade the earth, uh, and bringing a righteousness that, that was dominant on earth, and then Christ would come to a, a righteous earth. Um, the problem with this is time and history. Uh, first of all, it's not terribly well grounded in Scripture, although Habakkuk 2.14 says that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the seas. And we do believe that the gospel will spread to the ends of the earth. Jesus said that, uh, that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all nations, and then the end will come. Uh, so there's, there's biblical grounding to this, to this belief. The problem became when a thousand years passed, and and the earth wasn't getting any better, and time went on, and, and then hundreds of years after the first thousand, we begin to wonder, well, maybe it's not, you know, literally a thousand years, maybe it's figurative. And, uh, and as the gospel spread uh, uh, and the population grew, uh, the places where this gospel has spread uh, have, have multiplied. But has righteousness really multiplied? Has the world become a better place? Well, I don't know. You know, in the 1950s, if you uh, went out of your house, you probably didn't lock your door, and you didn't lock your car, and you didn't worry about putting a chain on your bicycle. You, you don't imagine doing those things nowadays. You lock everything. Uh, uh, we hear of all kinds of wars and murders and crimes. It doesn't seem like the world has gotten to be a better place. Um, it doesn't seem like God is promoting his kingdom through our efforts. And as we look at the scriptures, we recognize that it is through his efforts that his kingdom is established. Uh, even when we saw the battle of the rider on the white horse last week, uh, we recognize that Jesus led the battle. And the armies of heaven, which would include us and the angels, were behind him. And the enemy was defeated not by a clash that, that spread over you know, nations and, and throughout the world, it, it was done by the word of his mouth, by the, by the sword that came from his mouth, the word, uh, Jesus slew uh, all the enemy armies, period. We didn't do anything. Um, the, the, the greatest, one of the greatest battles of history will be a non-event because Jesus will just simply do it. Uh, in the same way, uh, as his kingdom is ushered in, it will come through our efforts. It will come through his establishing that. Um, if Satan has been bound through church, church history, uh, how would you explain uh, the, the way that the world has gone, uh, the reality of, of sin in the world? Well, uh, the post-millennialist would explain it that uh, uh, it's simply human depravity. We no longer can use the excuse that the devil made me do it. No, I did it because of my own sin was. One of the good things about post-millennialism is that because they believed the spread of the gospel would bring in the kingdom of God, there was a missionary zeal that came with that. And, and many missionary movements of spreading the gospel were inspired uh, by this theology. Uh, amillennialism, I, I deal with next. Amillennialism sees uh, the language of Revelation as symbolic or figurative, as much of the vision of Revelation is. And uh, that the thousand of years may not be a thousand, um, and uh, that, uh, um, that uh, this is reflecting a, a heavenly reign, reign or spiritual reign. In other words, uh, after the cross, when believers uh, died, their spirit was raised to heaven, and from heaven they reign with Christ over what happens in the world now. Uh, and at his second coming, he will bring the new heaven and the new earth. Um, amillennialism um, uh, believes in the two resurrections. And the first resurrection is the resurrection of the spirit. And the second resurrection is the resurrection of the body. And um, uh, again, you've got to use a lot of figurative language. And, and here in, in these seven verses... With the thousand years being repeated six times, it just seems that that much emphasis is referring to a thousand years. Uh, it just seems pretty plain. And it, with that much emphasis, um, I, I agree with David Jeremiah that the thousand years is, is literally a thousand years. Uh, 
Premillennial dispensationalism is, uh, uh, again, believing that, that Jesus comes and he establishes his kingdom. In other words, uh, after the uh, battle of the, the white horse, uh, he comes to earth with his saints and they set up a kingdom on earth. Um, when David Jeremiah talks about uh, premillennialism, uh, he talks in terms of, of political nations, uh, Israel being reestablished. Uh, he'll even use Russia as Gog and Magog that will oppose, oppose Christ. Those aren't here. Uh, those are theological guesses. Um, I don't think they have uh, that much strength in, in the argument. Uh, I don't think that we can really name in these end times, you know, it's going to be this one and that one and, and they're going to go here. Uh, the, the language of, of Revelation really doesn't give us that. The reestablishment of Israel as a nation and the rebuilding of the temple, which uh, dispensationalists look for, um, I, I think uh, is, is counterproductive in that why would we need to rebuild the temple and reestablish the sacrifice? Christ has been sacrificed once for all time. Okay, from Hank Hennigraf. Right, yeah. Um, that, that, that God doesn't need to reestablish a, a sacrifice. But one sacrifice for all time has been done in Jesus Christ. Well, our forgiveness has been accomplished for all time. And his grace is sufficient for all people in all time. Uh, therefore, to, to recreate uh, these things just doesn't really make sense. Um, the the uh, uh, pre trib or the pre Millennial dispensationalist is also pre-trib in that they believe that the rapture of the church, that God will take the church up into heaven with him before any of the tribulation happens, before any, any troubles happen as well. Uh, historical premillennialism um, believes that the church will be in, on earth uh, for the tribulation or at least for part of the tribulation. Um, and that it, maybe cut short uh, for the sake of the, of the church as well. Um, also looks to the church as the true Israel of God, uh, that the promises of Israel will be fulfilled in the church because it's by faith that we become children of Abraham. Uh, I find myself sort of between those two camps uh, because I do believe that uh, God will uh, have a, a major turning of Jews uh, hearts to Christ. I believe that there will be a, a turning to faith of the Jews. Uh, but I also believe that we have been, as a church, as Gentiles, have been grafted into the vine of Israel. That's the language that the Bible, Bible teaches. But it is the vine of, of Israel from which salvation comes. We've been grafted in. How much more can the original branches be grafted back in is the argument that, that Paul uses. Um, now when uh, well, the, so so there's a um, there, there's a, a combination of both that, uh, that the true Israel will uh, will be resurrected, uh, will be uh, will come to faith in Christ. Now, I do believe that just because someone's Jewish in descent uh, does not mean that they will be saved. A Jewish atheist, for instance, uh, has turned against his faith. Uh, it's not the Jewishness, the, the descent, the genetics that make a person a Jew. It's faith in, in God. Uh, and uh, the scriptures call for a, a return to faith of unbelieving Jews, uh, but not, uh, not a salvation of Jews just because of their ancestry. Uh, the promises of God will be fulfilled in all ways, I believe that. With that theological background and all the theological stuff we got there, I want to turn back to the scriptures. And... Are you okay, Al? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. I want you to turn back in the scriptures uh, to uh, verse 4 uh, of our passage in Revelation 20. In the first part of that, it says, Then I saw thrones, and the people sitting on them had been given the authority to judge. Now, 
Here, John in his revelation does not specify how many thrones. Um, we don't know. And uh, whether, you know, all the church is sitting on thrones or whether there's a, a, a specific number, like the visions we saw earlier where the elders, the 24 elders sat on 24 thrones. There's no number here. So any, anything that we would say would be a guess. There's also a judgment that takes place here. Um, and we know nothing about the nature of the judgment, but it is not the final judgment. The final judgment we'll read about later on in verse 20, in chapter 20, the great white throne judgment, the judgment of salvation, the judgment of, of uh, condemnation for those who uh, have accepted the mark of the beast. Uh, that will come later. But there is somebody to judge. Now, these things bring up all kinds of questions. At least they do for me. Who are they judging? Didn't Jesus just come and wipe out the whole enemy army with the word of his mouth? Uh, who's left? Well, is it possible that there are people still on earth who were not part of the army? It's possible. Um, we don't know. And that's the truth. Uh, anything that I would say would be a guess. Um, but there is a judging going on. There is a, a, a ruling that goes on for these people who are on the throne. And uh, the second part of verse 4 uh, and, and to the rest of the verse, uh, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony about Jesus. Now the word beheaded here mean, refers to having your head chopped off with an axe. Okay, very specific. Um, and for proclaiming the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his statue, nor accepted his mark on their forehead or on their hands. They all came to life again, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So here, um, the people uh, that uh, are, are here are, uh, first of all, literally described as the martyrs. Uh, most literally described as those particular martyrs whose heads have been chopped off. Uh, does that leave out the ones who were beaten to death or crucified or, or uh, whatever? Um, that's a theological question, okay? Uh, we look at that and we say, well, um, is it just the martyrs? Is it just those who've been killed? Is it just those who've been killed in that specific way? Or does it include those who have... Uh, just stood for Christ, their testimony for proclaiming the word of God, those who proclaim the word of God. And most theologians, when they look at this, these scriptures, uh, and they look at the whole of scripture, uh, look at this and, and uh, ascribe to the church in general that, that all of us will reign with Christ if we are believers. Um, and honestly, that's what I would ascribe to too. I, I think that's probably the best description. Um, but there is room for, um, for uh, the opposite, that it would just be the martyrs. Now, I say that because it, it's important that as we look at these things, we recognize the things that we really know and the things that we think we know and not be too dogmatic about the things that we think we know <coughs> Trust the Lord for the for the details. We can we can take some comfort in the things we think we know, but but recognize that we haven't got it all down. The scriptures do say that we will reign with Him. Second Timothy two twelve says, if we endure hardship, we will reign with Him. Uh, talking about all the church, uh, and there are other scriptures that talk about us reigning with Christ, uh, and so so we see that that it doesn't take too much of a leap here to say that this language is figurative uh, and it includes the whole church. Uh, there's room for, for dissension there. Also, in verses 4 and 5, you'll notice there are two resurrections spoken about. Um, the last part of verse 4, I'll start with, they all came to life again. They reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This is the first resurrection. The rest of the dead did not come back to life until the thousand years had ended. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. For them the second death holds no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. Two resurrections spoken of here. Um, now, the, if it is all the church as, as we believe this is the 
where the church would be physically resurrected with an eternal physical body. Um, and, uh, and the way we would explain that is that later, the later second resurrection would be the resurrection that happens of uh, the unredeemed dead that happens before the great white throne judgment. It is at that point uh, that they would be susceptible to the second death because the scriptures do tell us that they will be thrown into the lake of fire which is the second death. Um, but this also would, would fit if, if the church has been uh, physically resurrected and reigns with Christ for a thousand years, they would have been resurrected uh, before the, uh, white, uh, the rider on the white horse battle um, and they would have been caught up in the air with the Lord uh, and battled with the Lord uh, there and then, then he would have come with them into in, the earth to establish the, the millennium, the thousand year reign. Um, it would fit well with what Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 where he writes, For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to, raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. First the believers who have died will rise from their graves, then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. And so as we put these together, we would see that, that the saints have been raised. Uh, we see that in chapter 14 in the great harvest. Uh, they become part of the heavenly army uh, that descends from heaven with the Lord uh, in, in white linen. Living believers would be raised with them at that time as well. And then uh, they would descend to be on, on the earth for the thousand year, year reign. Um, the second resurrection then would just be for the unredeemed. Now we have been told that uh, as believers we have eternal life. So we don't have to worry about the second death. Um, and so saying the second death has no power over them, that would be something that applies to all believers. Again, uh, a suggestion that all believers are included in the, in the millennium. Uh, Jesus said the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have <coughs> eternal life. We, we know we have eternal life. We also know that that second death is eternal is the eternal death. John, uh, Revelation 20, verse 14 and 15 says this lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. <coughs> now it is again possible that only the martyrs uh, would be reigning for a thousand years in, in response to their crying out from under the altar in, in uh, chapter 6. Uh, that this would be a special reward for those who suffered for Christ. Um, but most theologians see it as, as including the church. Now... Now, everything we look at creates another question. They will reign with Christ for a thousand years. Reign over whom? Again, the question of, is there anybody left after the, the battle on the white horse? Uh, as he wipes out the army, possibly there are. Well, after all, after the thousand years, there are going to be people who rebel against Christ again and come to make war against him again. We'll see that in the end of chapter 20. So there seem to be some people, and those would be the people that would be reigned over. But if we're wrong on that count, um, because it really doesn't specify, then, then who do the saints reign over? Do they reign over one another? Um, and, and, and that seems unbiblical. Um, really, the, the desire to reign over one another, the desire to have authority over one another or to oppress one another comes out of our, our fallen nature, not out of our redeemed nature. Um, that, uh, uh, that we look to oppress one another. Jesus said, among you, if somebody wants to be great, how do they become great? They become servant of all. Um, you want to be great, you, better be, you want to be first, you better be last. You want to be great, uh, don't be like the, the, uh, uh, the Gentiles, who those who in authority want to rule it over, but they want, to, they want to exert their power. Jesus doesn't want us to be like that. If he doesn't want us to be like that, it doesn't seem that that, that would make sense in the millennium that we'd be 
uh, ruling it over one another uh, as we reign with Christ. That doesn't make sense. So maybe we're asking the wrong question. Maybe it isn't who will they reign over, but what will they reign over? When human beings were originally created and put in the Garden of Eden, they were put there with a purpose, to reign over all of creation, to reign over nature itself. We look back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. Because of the fall, because of the curse, uh, man's reign over nature has been, uh, has been frustrated, at least. Uh, that we now work uh, by the toil of our hands when we eat our food. That, that the ground, instead of producing uh, what we want it to produce, produces thorns and thistles and weeds. And perhaps in this thousand year reign, it will be a reign over creation itself. Now... There are theologians who, when they go to talk about this, and some of you have you know, helped me with various uh, um, books and, and articles and, and things like that. And uh, it, I, I listened to a, a book that I bought from David Jeremiah, and he describes this thousand-year reign as being a perfect utopia, um, where all nature is, is right, where there's righteousness, where there's no unrighteousness. Um, and honestly, I have a problem with that. Um, he's assigning to the thousand year reign, the millennium, something that has been specifically assigned to the new earth. Uh, we get no descriptions of what this millennium is going to be like in that way. Nothing's mentioned. Uh, so we really don't know. Uh, but there's got to be some imperfections here because there is still... Um, there's still the need for somebody to judge. There's, there's still something that's imperfect. There, there's still the, the seed of sin that's there because it hasn't been completely done away with yet. The, the millennium is happening on the present earth. And we know that the present earth is, is scheduled for destruction. That God may send the new earth and the new heaven. Um, and, and so... It doesn't seem like God ever describes the millennium on the present earth as being perfect. It does describe that specifically for the new earth. And so taking Old Testament scriptures and such and saying, oh, that's going to be part of the millennium uh, is uh, theological guesswork. Uh, it doesn't say it can't happen, but it doesn't say it can at that point. It doesn't say that that's what God is promising us at that point. And I think at that point, it's, it's more important to be biblical than theological. Um, Satan will not have influence on those who are on the earth, but uh, sin comes from within us, doesn't it? Um, James, when he writes about sin, he says, when desire conceives, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. If something comes from within us, we can't say, like Flip Wilson used to say, the comedian used to say, well, the devil made me do it. You know, um, we won't be able to blame the devil during the millennium. Uh, but that doesn't mean that people will be without sin because, uh, because of our own fallen nature. Uh, I also hear, you know, all the uh, um, guesswork that happens really about, about Israel and about establishing the, the nation again, establishing the, the uh, uh, temple, but also that the 144,000 who are sealed, um, that they would become great evangelists and evangelize the world. Uh, it's the only way that they can describe, well, we've already been raptured, the church is gone, but, but you know, there's going to be believers after that they they're obviously there, and in Revelation there's obviously still the opportunity to repent. Um, but assigning to Israel that the 144,000 that are sealed become these great evangelists and evangelize the world is, is pure guesswork. Um, could be, but the Bible never says that. We just need to be careful about what the Bible really never says and putting words into God's mouth that, that aren't there. God will fulfill His promises. He will fulfill his promises to the church. 
And he will fulfill his promises to his people, Israel. Paul writes about that in Romans chapter 11. I encourage you to look at Romans 11 when you go home, uh, if you're interested in that. And Paul says, God has not rejected his own people whom he chose from the very beginning. Then he says, many of the people of Israel are now enemies of the good news. And this benefits you Gentiles. Yes, yet they are still the people he loves because he chose their ancestors. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. God's gifts and his call will never be withdrawn. God's promises will never be be cast away. When God promises, He keeps His promise. Even if we are not faithful, He is always faithful to His promise. Always faithful. Now, alright, I've thrown a lot of theology at you. And I've thrown a lot of uh, confusing stuff at you. There's a lot of questions. And as if we had some question and answer time, I'm sure we could just keep going and finding new questions about this. It seems when you first read it, it's pretty straightforward. A thousand years, reign of Christ. Isn't that simple? Uh, but there's all kinds of stuff we don't know, isn't there? But it's okay to have questions, and I hope that the very fact that we've raised questions today will, will spur you on to go deeper in God's Word, to gain a greater understanding of God's Word. And it will make a hunger that will make you regular in, in, in reading God's Word. Someday, all this will be clearer. Someday, we will understand this. Someday, when we get to heaven, we'll see that, wow, God made all this come to pass. Nothing in His Word will fall away. Everything that He's written in this book will happen, just as He said. And someday, we're going to say, well, I didn't really... I, I, there's no way that I could see how that was going to work, but that over there and that over there. But someday, we're going to see... Oh, so that's how it all comes together. Even Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, he says, Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. If Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, would say, I don't know everything, I'm still learning. If he could define Christian maturity as the attitude of knowing that I don't know everything, and the more I discover, the more I discover that there's more to discover. If Paul could have that attitude, then that should be our attitude as well. That should be what we are striving for as believers in Jesus Christ, to continually grow recognizing that through eternity we will continue to discover awesome things about God that we didn't know before. Amen. And Pam, I'll put in a plug with that too. And if that's true, you ought to be going to Christian Life Development Center and Sunday School so you can learn some more. Amen. <laughs> and being in God's Word every day so that we can learn. The very fact that the millennium describes those who are resurrected as those who have been beheaded because of their testimony and because of their declaring the word about Christ, should say to us that if that's the way that we're described, if that includes us, then we ought to be holding nothing back in following Jesus Christ. We ought to be fully surrendered to him. We ought to be following him with everything that is in us, holding nothing in reserve. There will be a resurrection someday. We know this. Someday we will be raised from the dead. Death does not have the final word. We know that eternal life comes through Jesus Christ and that somehow He's going to get us all home safely. And that God desires for every person who's ever been created to come to eternal life. That's why He sent His Son into the world. That Jesus might bear the wrath of God on sin and that he might put it to death on the cross that anyone who believes in him that anyone who trusts in him might be saved from God's wrath and, and delivered to eternal life 
restored to a right relationship with God. Jesus made the way, but he didn't just make the way. He is the way. And so regardless of where our theology falls, it should fall on Jesus. Amen. Because some of these things we've talked about are not foundational to the faith. But our faith in Jesus Christ is. If you have never trusted in Christ as your Lord and Savior, He invites you to come to Him. He invites you to eternal life with Him. He invites you to the forgiveness of your sins that you might have a right relationship with God. And that eternal life might begin as soon as you trust Him. Because when we trust in Him, He gives us His Holy Spirit to live in Him, who is the deposit guaranteeing what is to come. The assurance of God that we have eternal life and that we are living for eternity now as we live for Christ. We're told that when we trust in Him, we have been born again. We have been given a new life. That new life is eternal life, which can be found only in Jesus Christ, in Him alone. He is the way and the truth and the life. And if you're going to come to the Father, if you're going to be made right with God, it happens to Him. We invite you to that faith in Jesus Christ this morning. If you've never trusted in Christ, make today the day that you say, Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins and I need your forgiveness. And I want to walk with you and I want that eternal life that you have for me. That, that I might walk in your ways and turn away from sin and turn to you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as as we explore your word, we find incredible things there, and some of them just make our heads spin. Some of them make us pretty confused, but, but this we know. You have sent your son because you love us, and you want us to be with you forever. And Jesus considered each one of us so precious that we were to die for. That's exactly what he did when he laid down his life, that he who had no sin became sin for us, that in him we might, might become the righteousness of God. Help us to walk in that righteousness each day, Lord. If there are those among us today who have never trusted in you, just touch them in a special way by your Holy Spirit, for we are powerless to come to you unless you reveal yourself to us. I pray that you would reveal yourself to them today. May they feel your hand upon their shoulder and be lifted up in this time. Open their hearts so they can trust in you and have a right relationship. Receive the eternal life that you so desire for them to have because you don't want them to be apart from you for eternity. Lord, for those of us who are walking with you, May the questions of today drive us deeper into your word. Make us more bold in spreading your word. Make us more determined to live for you with everything that is in us, holding nothing back. For you are good, and you are righteous, and you are holy, and your ways are true, and completely, they are completely trustworthy. Help us to trust in them in the little decisions and in the big things that we face. In Jesus' name.